Once again, Rob McDonald, I'll be talking about OpenBSP's wave drag capability, and hopefully we'll do a better job of fitting to our time slot with this talk. Uh, all right, how's that, Brandon? Yep, we can see it, thank you. Great. So we'll start off um, with, a, with a flyby picture, a glamour shot of the F5, um, F5E. This is, I think, in Swiss Levelry. And just to show some, some things that are typical of a supersonic aircraft, in particular, what we'd like to notice is this narrowing here of the fuselage, what we call coke bottling. And that's um, a technique that's used to reduce the, the wave drag of a supersonic aircraft. And similarly, um, this is a working plot from on an F5E. This is a, a, a Northrop chart, um, says right here, F5E. And what we're looking at is a hand-drawn chart of the cross-sectional area distribution along the fuselage. And you can see each of the components. This line starts off as the fuselage contribution. And then down here, there's the contribution of the canopy and the wing, where here there's a leading edge extension, vertical stabilizer, horizontal stabilizer, and a drag chute and an ejector. So each of these components is drawn on these distributions down here at the bottom. And then they're also drawn again, this is a little bit confusing, but they're drawn as a stack up. So the fuselage is drawn first, and then where the canopy adds on top of it, that's drawn as another line on top to add to it. At the end of the fuselage, it goes into, blends into the nacelles because the engines are all blended together. So you see the fuselage part comes down, but the nacelle comes on top. And here we see the nacelle added on top of the canopy. That leading edge extension blends into that wing and the wing adds on top. So all these components, we can see that they're drawn stacked up or they're drawn as separate components. And this is how, you know, supersonic airplanes have been designed since we figured out the, the area rule with the F-102. And uh, this kind of area distribution analysis is, is fundamentally important. Uh, similarly, here's one that I threw in just for fun. It's the same type of chart from the same report, uh, but in this time it's perimeter around the fuselage. So if you, if you took a string and you looped it around that part of an F-5 and measured the length of the string, you'd get this perimeter distribution in the same way. And by integrating this perimeter distribution, uh, you get the wetted area. And we've already talked about the wetted area calculations that OpenBSP will do. And right up here, here's the wetted areas of the, the fuselage, the nacelle, the canopy, each of these components added up. So these, uh, these kinds of calculations that VSP is doing for us based on the geometry are, are tried and true and how, how we design the planes for a long time. So there's been a lot of existing tools uh, historically for doing the kind of wave drag calculation that we're talking about today in OpenBSP. Um, the, the, the main ones that people might be familiar with are called the, the Harris Wave Drag Code, which is a NASA code um, that's available through PDAS. Uh, if you want to go out and compile the Fortran yourself and work with that, um, or sort of an updated version of it called A-Wave that's made a lot of the rounds. It was written by Arnie McCullers, uh, where the A in A-Wave stands for Arnie. Um, it's a little bit harder to get a hold of, but it's certainly out there and available. And really what we're doing with VS Piero is analogous to both of these. We're doing similar things, just with uh, sort of better geometry, better computer science for the most part, but the same physics. Wave drag theory, I'm not going to go super deep into this, but it is a linearized theory and it is a far field analysis. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the momentum uh, change from the airplane on the cylinder far away from the aircraft. And it's based on the observation that if you orient a plane along the Mach angle, um, we can look at that cross-sectional area uh, that, that mock plane passes, and that tells us something about the um, the momentum out there on that cylinder. And so this analysis, the important part here is this integral, this integral I. You'll see it ends up being a double integral in the second derivative of the uh, area distribution. So S prime prime, S is the area distribution, S prime prime is the second derivative. It's a double integral, so we have it at the X location and the Y location. And this is this is where these actually, this X and this Y, the Y is not really 
out the way it's labeled here. These are two, two coordinates down the X. So from nose to tail, we do a double integral where one of these integrals is over X and the other is over Y. And so this integral actually shows up in other aerodynamic contexts as well. It's actually the, um, the uh, integral for induced drag when you're looking at a Treffitt's plane analysis. And it shows up a few other places. So this is a good integral to know and love. Um, and we'll be working with that. So what you do um, sort of mechanistically is we're going to take cutting planes and we're going to tilt them first back at the mock angle, mu, and then we're going to rotate them around the airplane. You can imagine first leaning it back to the canopy and then we might tilt that and lean it back towards the wing and then tilt it down underneath towards the landing gear. So there's two rotations that we're talking about. There's the mock angle and then there's theta, how many times around the clock we're going to do this. And each time we're going to take this plane and we're going to take a cut with that plane with the aircraft and find out that cross-sectional area. We don't use that area directly. We then project that into 2D. We project that back into the forward projection of it and we take that area. And then that's the area that we then are taking the second derivative of and doing the wave drag integral. Now, through this analysis, there's also the possibility to calculate which part of the airplane contributes the most to the wave drag. And this is something that my student who did this years ago um, put in and figured out so that we would have the additional intuition. So you'd be able to look at a configuration and see where most of the drag was coming from. And we've added this to the GUI so there's a button that'll jump to this uh, and it'll show you where the drag hotspot is, so to speak, to help you design the airplane. Uh, I tested this the other night and I'm not convinced it's working right right now. So I'm gonna talk about the theory, but I'm not gonna demo it because I don't think it's working and I need to do some debugging. Uh, but hopefully we'll get it fixed soon. But the idea here, returning to this integral, is if we look at the integrand and we first we look at this log term, we see that this is going to reach a maximum as X is equal to Y. So that if we could drive the absolute value of X minus Y to zero, then X is equal to Y, and that's going to drive uh, this integrand to a maximum. So we've got this double integral along the body. So when we're looking at the same station, X and Y are together, that's gonna maximize that integral. And likewise, if X is equal to Y, then we can look at this product where the second derivative of S, if X is equal to Y, then what we're looking at here is S prime prime squared. And so clearly the maximum magnitude of this contribution to the integral occurs at the maximum absolute value of S prime prime. And so wherever the maximum magnitude of S prime prime is, so the maximum magnitude of the second derivative of the area distribution is gonna be the, the thing that contributes the most to the drag. So that's what, we're, what we hope to be looking for when we do that. Okay, now taking this integral um, is tricky. Uh, we're taking a, an integral of second derivatives and the hard part here is really in how do we estimate, how do we calculate those second derivatives? And the way this is done, and this is this is a classical calculation that was is attributed to uh, Evelyn Edmonton and Lord, uh, who were in the RAE over in the UK. And the Edmonton Lord process is instead of taking the say finite discrete points along a body and estimating second derivatives with a finite difference between those points, instead of doing that, what we do is we fit a Fourier series to the points that we've observed. And if, you're, if there's say 20 points in the sample, we don't just fit a 20 term Fourier series, we, we add extra terms. Maybe we do a 40 term Fourier series. And what that does is that 40 term series with 20 observed points gives us 20 extra degrees of freedom. And so the edmonton lord procedure, the clever part is we're then free to choose those additional 20 coefficients any way we want because the first 20 coefficients are chosen in a way to match the data the remaining 20 can be chosen as we want and so the derivation that edmonton lord put together is to choose them in a way that gives us the minimum wave drag so we're choosing the fourier series that agrees with the data 
but that has additional freedom in order to minimize the drag. And that's the trick that makes uh, this process really efficient and really cool. And this is how basically everybody does it. Um, it's buried in the Harris Wave Drag Code and in A-Wave. Uh, it's also something that is done for um, induced drag integrals. There's some interesting work where you can estimate the induced drag um, from knowing the spanwise load distribution at, say, maybe as few as five points. So here's just a graphical representation. If you take an area distribution along a body and you were to just sort of treat them piecewise linear, you can imagine trying to estimate a second derivative by taking a finite difference over, say, three points nearby, and you're going to get a very crude approximation of the second derivative along that body. And instead, what Edmonton Lord does is we fit that Fourier series and then we allow the extra coefficients to find the smoothest curve, the, the least drag curve that agrees with all that data. And consequently, we get a very smooth uh, representation and we know the second derivative of that very well. And uh, we can also use that to find our maximum value of that second derivative, which allows us to find the, the largest contribution to the wave drag as well. Now, this all comes to mean that the wave drag calculation is a little bit odd. It's a little bit different to deal with from what many of us are used to when we think about computer codes and about how they converge. And so if you're going to use the wave drag tool, I, I recommend you, you gain some experience and you adopt what I like to call the Zen of wave drag. Um, and there's a few things here that are important to this formulation and how the Edmonton Lord process works. First, the Edmonton Lord process, the this the and not just Edmonton Lord, but this this integral in the first place, uh, in the linearized calculation, in the assumptions here, it's based on the area distribution being smooth and continuous, and smooth and continuous to second derivatives. And so if your aircraft is not smooth and continuous, um, you're gonna have not only more drag, but you're also going to violate the assumptions. So you don't want to do that. You want to keep your airplane smooth and continuous. And you'll notice that the that the curve generated by the Edmonton Lord procedure is always going to be smooth and continuous. Uh, what this also means, though, if you think about this, right, the points now, since this is now an optimization to optimize and find the minimum drag given the points that are supplied, the points that are supplied are now acting as constraints. The curve must go through them, but we're finding the minimum drag shape subject to those constraints. So what this means is as you add more points, if instead of, I don't know, say a dozen points that we have here, you went to 40 points or 50 points, as you add more points, you're adding more constraints. And so your optimization problem, what's the minimum drag subject to the constraints, as you add more constraints, that means the drag is going to go up, right? The drag is going to always increase. And as you add more points in this calculation, the drag will always increase. It does not converge to a fixed value the way many tools that we're accustomed to would converge. At the same time, uh, there's other things that happen. Imagine this area, will say the location where your wing just starts to in intersect with your fuselage. Um, if you have a relatively sparse set of points along your aircraft, then the optimization, the Evelyn, the, the Edmonton Lord procedure can come in. And since it doesn't have a tremendous amount of data there, it can essentially smooth over that wing body junction. And it can design what is the minimum drag area distribution that agrees with the points that you have. And what that means is if your aircraft needs a blend at some corner, some wing body blend uh, that obviously VSP can't model because VSP doesn't have the ability to, to model blends and fairings, the Edmonton Lord procedure will actually tell you both what the blend should look like, i.e. what's the area distribution of that blend, and it will also tell you what the drag would be 
if you had designed it with that blend in place. So there's a lot of things going on using the characteristics of this Edmonton Lord procedure that are not like a normal tool. So the Zen of wave drag is first, may your distributions be smooth and continuous. Your airplane needs to be smooth and continuous for, for good wave drag anyway. It's important to the assumptions fundamental to the linearized theory. It's, it's a fundamental thing going on here. Seek not convergence, right? Increasing the number of points to 40, 50, 100, 150, that's silly, right? That's not how this tool works. As you do that, your wave drag is going to increase until the matrix becomes singular, and then the whole thing will blow up. Um, that's not good for anyone. So it doesn't converge in that way. Fewer points in, in with within reason. So maybe the right answer is in that 20 or 30 range. Um, fewer points are better because you're allowing the optimization procedure, the ability to fare out some of these uh, sharp corners and other characteristics of your aircraft while still capturing the fundamental nature of its area distribution. And so through that, I like to think of it when I run this tool, I like to think of Evelyn Edmonton sort of over my shoulder and helping me design the airplane. So, you know, let Evelyn be your guide. Let her let her be with you and she'll help you design a better airplane by by putting your blends and your area area ruling in where it needs to go and telling you the drag of a well-designed airplane. So embrace what it's doing here and, and you'll be you'll be happy. So this kind of tool has the ability to model engine flow through and there's a number of ways to do that. One is you can model your nacelle or your engine by poking a hole through the middle and, and just we'll calculate the area distribution through that. And you'll notice this inner surface here is curved. So we'll model, you know, taking that area distribution as part of the area of the aircraft. And whether that's appropriate in terms of your thrust drag accounting and the fact that your engine really has, you know, a core and turbine blades and compressor blades and everything else in here, you know, that may not be the best way to go, but you can certainly punk a hole through the airplane. We now have the ability um, to do this this tool, since it's doing cross-sectional areas, it's actually CompGeom based. So we now have the ability to do negative components in CompGeom, as mentioned earlier, and that extends to wave drag calculation. So you can also, in this case, what I've done is I've made the outer of this nacelle, I've made it transparent and I've closed off the front and the back with, with flat planes. You can't see them here, but they're closed off right there. And then I've designed this gold plug as a negative component that follows the same mold line. So it follows that curved mold line, and then it extends just a little bit in front of and behind so that we have this plug that will actually cut out through the middle. And so that'll poke a hole back through it. Uh, you could also do that with just a straight section. You could just do it with a straight line, just a simple cylinder. And in that case, it'll extend through and chop out. And that may be more appropriate given your, your thrust drag accounting means. And then finally, the other, the last way to model uh, propulsion effects in the wave drag tool is here I've used the subsurface, this slightly darker black line on the front of this red engine. Um, this, this black line is a subsurface denoting where the inlet is. And there's another one you can't see on the outlet. And what we'll do is we can actually take that subsurface and extend it forward to infinity and back to infinity and using that to to block out the um the the flow that would go through the engine and so we've got these multiple different ways to model um flow through in a in any sort of an airplane um with wave drag so different different strategies that you may want to try this flow through just to sort of see what's going on you know, if we if we just take a normal airplane and it has a discontinuous area change at an inlet and at the exit, you'll see a jump in the inlet and at the exit here. And if we then extend that area to infinity and we repeat, what you'll see here is that we now start at a non-zero area and we end at a non-zero area, but we have a nice smooth area distribution along the body. So here we've we've extended it and we have that. There's actually different ways of working with this. We can do exactly what we just said there. We can take that curve and we can subtract that area. But if the inlet and the exit area are not identical, you might end up with a negative area at the end. Or you could even take a, a linear distribution here and you could say, OK, if I had a linear function going from the inlet area to the exit area 
and I subtract that linear distribution across from it, that way I get one that starts and ends at zero. The important thing in this is remember that the calculation is based on an integral of the second derivatives, and that's all it knows. And so if you think about it, when I shift this curve up and down, the second derivative does not change at all. Even if part of the curve's area goes negative, its second derivative is still the same. And likewise, the second derivative of a linear function is zero. So if I add, I superimpose a linear function on this to make it start and end at zero, I'm adding a second derivative of zero. And so the second derivative of all three of these functions is identical. Um, and so what happens is, is using either of these three things, the second derivative of the area is identical. And so the wave drag contribution is identical. It doesn't matter which way we do it. And so there's, there's different trade-offs we can do, but we've got that handled. Here's just an example where for the subsurfaces, we've, um, on this model, I've added the inlet and the outlet subsurface using a line type where U, which is the circumferential coordinate, in a constant U, and then we're marking the inlet is U less than 0.25, so it's this front, and, and the outlet is U greater than 0.75, so that's that back that you can't see. Um, inside, you know, we go through and we figure out based on the normal vector of that surface, if it's pointing forward, we extend it forward. If it's pointing aft, we extend it aft. If for some reason you mark an engine inlet or an outlet and some of the surfaces are pointing forward and some of them are pointing aft, we get confused. We don't know which way to extend it. So please, you know, if you're going to use the surface extension technique, uh, be unambiguous in your control, in your inlets and outlets. Don't have them point both ways. And that's probably a good idea for aircraft design in the first place. So here's an example, just a cartoon where we take this airplane and we've marked these inlet circles here and outlets there. And you can see we extend the cylinders forward before we take the areas. And that just shows how we've modified that geometry to do that. Um, we automatically figure out where the cutting plane should start. So we look at the mock angle and the theta that you're looking at and we determine which part of the aircraft, which corner uh, touches first. So we find the initial, the starting point for the areas and the ends. And we do that automatically for you. You don't have to worry about that as a user at all. And like I said, we go through and we chop up the airplane along the mock planes and then for a bunch of theta cuts. And so the output ends up being the sort of rat's nest on the right. Where in red, we show the outer mold line mesh of the aircraft. And then in the rainbow underneath, we show all of the different cutting planes. We did some tests when we developed this. Uh, we compared with some classical answers. I'm going to fly through these because I'm running long once again, um, just to show that we get the kind of convergence. I know I said don't worry about convergence, but when you have a smooth analytical answer like this, um, we can we can maybe show some convergence. To, uh, particularly since the Sears hack body is an optimal shape, we should do a great job of converging to the optimal shape. And sure enough, it does. So we can verify that the code's implemented right. And from there, we have the opportunity um, to go in and do a demo. The rest of the slides and all these slides will be uploaded, go through and talk about the GUI, um, how it works. And I, I, I don't think there's anything here that I won't cover in the demo. Um, so let me just do that real quick. And hopefully we have five minutes for a quick demo. Um, Brandon, can you tell me which screen is sharing? Uh, right now, it's showing the VSP folder in your mouse, and VSP is showing. Thank you. Perfect. So we'll start again, like I always do, with everybody's favorite airplane. Um, I've got one joke, and I'll keep using it. So here's the uh, here's a pod and a wing, and we'd like to know the wave drag of this aircraft. So to do that, we just click Analysis, and we come into Wave Drag. Like many of these other things, we get to choose what geometry set. So it defaults to the shown set. We could choose any other set that we want here. You have control over the number of slices, that's nose to tail, as well as the number of rotations, that's theta is around. And if your geometry is symmetrical, I suggest you choose this option to make it run faster. You pick your Mach number, and you get to set your reference area for the drag coefficient and an outlook file. And all of these things, I'm fine with the default. This is a this is a Mach one and a half airplane. Why not? And so all you do is you click start, and it does everything for you. So it just went through, and as you see, 
we have, if you come into the mesh geom here and you go to the other tab, we can turn off the slices. So what we have here is we've shown the mesh and we've shown how it intersects, um, although we haven't trimmed and thrown away all of those triangles um, for, for various reasons. But, you know, we've shown the outer mesh. If we hide that, we just look at the slices. You can look and they're, they're a bit of a mess because there's many, let's see, 20 times 10. So there's 200 slices here, but all the different thetas and all of the different, uh, and, and at that one Mach number, um, we've taken all the slices. And so the result of that is this area distribution on the right and the wave drag coefficient, again, based on this S ref, here's our wave drag coefficient output down here. Now, coming to the plot window, we can look at a lot of different things. So we have, this is the zero theta. And if we want to see what cutting plane we're actually looking at, we can turn on that box and it shows the cutting plane. So you'll see the zero theta is sort of the one tilted right back at the pilot's head, right? Right straight down the center. And if we want to look at different thetas, we can rotate around and look at different cutting planes all the way up. To, since we did half an airplane, that's going right down towards the landing gear. So that's going down towards the pilot's feet. And if you were looking over here on the right, um, as we click through, you'll notice that the area distributions in each of these cutting planes is different. So here's one sort of going out to the side, and you'll see that this cutting plane hits the wing much earlier than, say, our first cutting plane, where we don't, or our last cutting plane, where we don't hit the wing until halfway down the body. So we can look at these planes. We can also slide this line along. So if we want to look at, oh, what's happening right here, we notice there's this upturn. We can slide that along and we can see that that happens right where the body meets the wing. We can also grab the line and just move it back and forth. So we can place this anywhere we want. Uh, in addition here, Notice the plot style. Right now we're just plotting the total, but remember back to that F5 chart, we can instead plot the area of the parts. And so here we have the total is in black, the pod is in red, and the wing is in yellow. So we can show the components that contribute to that area, and we can see where they come from. We don't plot them all at once, but we can also do the buildup plot. So here we're showing that the pod is in red and the wing is in yellow. And in this case, the pod is added on top of the wing. So we can see that build up and with a more complicated geometry, you can see those stack up just like they did on that F5 drawing. And then we have the option of whether to show the points or not. The curve we're showing here is in fact the Edmonton Lord distribution. So we're seeing that curve for the total and you're seeing, you know, as we blend through this curve, this is that area distribution that Evelyn's telling us we really ought to have through here in order to minimize the drag subject to these observed points. If we also want to take it a step further than that, and we want to compare our distribution to a Sears hack body, a Von Karman Orgive, or a Light Hill body, we can choose on this pull down. And each of these are optimal shapes. A Sears hack is a closed volume, so its area comes to zero at the end for a given length and volume. So if you wanna match the same length and total volume of your vehicle, then you should match and try and get as close to a Sears hack distribution as you can. If instead, you're more worried about the length and the cross-sectional area or the length and the diameter, then a light hill body is the minimum drag shape for the same uh, maximum area. So if you had a component, whether it's an engine, a gun, a pilot, something that is a is the is constraining you in diameter rather than overall volume, then you want to aim towards a light hill shape. And the Von Karman Ogive has a finite ending area. So it's the minimum drag shape for the given length and diameter, but that ends with a blunt face like a bullet or a rocket. So those are those three reference shapes, classical shapes that you may want to compare to and how you can access them here. And then finally, there is a GUI on the inflow and outflow that if I had subsurfaces on here, you could turn them on so that, you know, you're not using, you're not extending flow from your ailerons, you're only extending them from your inlet and your outlet, um, and you get to choose which ones are on, and, and if you're not using negative geometry in order to represent your inflow and outflow. 
And that's the time I've got. Any questions, please ask them on the on, on the text and I will turn it over to the next presentation. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks a lot, Rob. And uh, great presentation as always. I appreciate the insight into that tool and uh, giving everyone some some guidance and best practices for how to how to use it and how powerful it can be.